Ladies, gentlemen, welcome to the colorful world of Skittles. Skittles brings you a jolt of five fruity flavors in every bite, giving you the chance to taste the rainbow like never before. Break free from the ordinary day-to-day with the help of Skittles' chewy candy. Skittles is a must in my candy jar, movie snack, even my secret to an afternoon pick-me-up. And I don't even care who knows it. Add a splash of joy to your day with Skittles. There's nothing better than fruity fun that tickles your taste buds. Taste the rainbow. Last time we spoke with comedian Ida Rodriguez, she was teeing up her HBO Max comedy special, Fighting Words, where in addition to making us laugh so hard it hurt, she gave us a window into her pain, allowing us to bear witness to her reunion with her estranged father. Now, Iva is giving us even more context with her new memoir, Legitimate Kid. We have done the career conversation. Definitely take a listen to our first episode because today we're going to get into the pain of a parent's absence, what happens when their presence isn't what you imagined, and the healing power of giving grace. Ida, welcome back. Thank you for having me back. You know I love you. Ida, I loved the book. I think the title, Legitimate Kid, kind of says it all. Take me back to the first time that you were teased for not having your dad's last name. Oh, yeah. I was third grade. This girl in my class made fun of me and called me a bastard. And she was like, your daddy didn't sign your birth certificate. And when I asked my mom what a bastard was, she said, that's a kid who doesn't have their father's last name. But it was just very casual. She didn't say, you are a bastard. I deduced that because I had her last name and my mother wasn't married. And that's when it started. It started when I was like, I was eight years old. It's so deep, that quest for legitimacy, right? Not just legitimacy inside your own family, but the need for external validation, the need to be legitimate in the eyes of men. You end up with so many men about whom there are red flags that you detail from beginning to end. Mm -hmm. The need for validation as a performer, as a model. I mean, you were drawn to both men and to fields where external validation is the whole game. What does it take? What has it taken for you to begin the process of undoing that need for finding that outside of yourself? It didn't start with me. It started with my kids because I loved my kids more than I loved myself. And so when my daughter started questioning things about her name and my son having issues about not having his dad, that is when I was like, I have to start working on this because I'm projecting this onto my kids and I want my kids to be whole and happy because they're not going to be made felt like they're less than because their dad is not in the house. They are whole human beings. They are capable. They are exceptional. And then through that work, I started working backwards onto myself. My kids have been my greatest teachers in life. You know, they fight for my esteem. They fight for my respect. They fight for my validation on a daily basis. They were the first ones to tell me you are somebody and for me, for it to actually resonate and actually land with me. It was those two. To the point about how important your kids are to you, you you have your first son, you're very young, and there's sort of this entire back and forth about will you stay with his dad, will you not stay with his dad? And finally he proposes to you, he wants to get married, and everything in your gut is screaming no. Like you knew it was not for you, you knew it was not the right choice, and it really is just sort of the the look on your son's face that seals the deal for you in that moment. And I wonder when you have times in your life when your gut tells you what to do, you ignore your gut, and then you end up finding out that you were right. If that builds the muscle memory of being like, no, now when I feel it in my gut, I got to listen. Yes and no. Like I have so many more instances when I just remember, you know, I think the problem with me was that I was programmed at such a young age to think about other people before myself. Which I just want to say is like a quintessentially Latina experience. 
Yeah. <laughs> the oldest kid. I was programmed to take care of other people first. So even when my gut is like, don't do this, don't do this, that immediate sensor to, you know, survey what's around me and what needs to be taken care of around me kind of takes priority over me. And unpacking that and saying no is something that didn't start for me until I was able to remove myself completely from my family and my environment in Miami when I had to go. Because, you know, people in Miami, we I joke about it. People will say, oh, the Cubans and the Puerto Ricans and the Dominicans. But reality of it is, is that collectively our cultures are really similar. We're broken up by dialects and the way we cook our bananas. But the and truth beans. is- and beans. But the truth is, is that we're essentially the same people, the way we were colonized and socialized, the things that happened to all of us, all of us, not just, you know, not just the dark skinned ones, not just the indigenous ones, all of us has had this effect on us. And so a lot of those things that were taught were taught across the board for all of us. And so for me, I was like, this is a cultural thing. Oh, I have to take care of my grandmother. Oh, I got to go translate. Oh, I can't go because my mom has to work and I can't leave my grandmother alone. I have to take care of my siblings. I had to get away from everybody. And it was only when I was able to get away from my family and that culture of guilt and shame that was driving everything was I then able to start unpacking and listening to my own gut. Shopify is your no excuses business partner. Sell without needing to code or design. Just bring your best ideas and Shopify will help you open up shop. Shopify is the e-commerce platform revolutionizing millions of businesses worldwide. Whether you're a garage entrepreneur or IPO ready, Shopify is the only tool you need to start, run and grow your business without the struggle. What I love about Shopify is how no matter how big it is you want to grow, Shopify gives you everything you need to take control and take your business to the next level. Shopify powers 10% of all e-commerce in the U.S. And Shopify is truly a global force powering Allbirds, Rothy's, and Brooklinen, and millions of other entrepreneurs of every size across over 170 countries. Plus, Shopify's award-winning help is there to support your success every step of the way. This is Possibility, powered by Shopify. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash latina. Go to shopify.com slash latina to take your business to the next level today. Shopify.com slash Latina. When you grow up without someone important in your life, I think there's a really natural tendency to lionize and mythologize that person, yeah. both who they are and what your life would be if they were in it. What were the stories you were telling yourself about who your dad was? And what did you think your life was going to look like if you were reunited? You know, it's funny. It would, it would always look like what I was seeing around me when I saw friends. My friend Norma in the book, she grew up with her dad in her house. Every day they would have dinner. Every day he would say, hey, how was your day to the kids? I would sit at the table and, and he would ask me and I would be like, really? You know, he would pick his daughter up and he was her protector. And it was for me, it was a lot about protection. And I use that word a lot because I ended up learning how to have to protect myself. And that always felt like something your father should do because that's what I was told. You're the princess, your dad protects you. So in my mind, my life would have been a lot easier and a lot of the bad things. I mean, when you don't have that person and you romanticize who they are, they get to be the rescuer in your life because they're there to counter the villain. And so in my mind, it was none of the things that would have happened to me. I know I remember being like 14 years old and saying none of this stuff would have happened to me if he would have been here. For your HBO Max special Fighting Words, I thought it was a real act of bravery and generosity that you choose to allow us as viewers watch you meet your dad for the first time. I felt watching it that I could sense your disappointment, that this just wasn't who you had imagined. And so to then read in Legitimate Kid about the fact that you were really disappointed. One, because no one could live up to the hype of what you just laid out. And two, you were meeting an older, less vibrant version of your dad. Yeah. It was disappointing. It was a moment of growth for me. It was a moment where I actually had to reconnect with the little girl in me and give her a hug 
you know, because the truth of it is, is that whether my father would have been 27, 47, 57, or whatever his current age is, he lived in a place where the privilege wasn't accessible to him. He didn't have a lot of opportunities in life. And the male privilege that he had was what allowed him to navigate in the spaces that he did. But he was still living in a poverty-stricken country, struggling with the ills of the toxic masculinity. He had a lot of trauma as well. But yeah, you know, you go there and you think, you know, especially if you've built this thing up in your head and no matter how old you are, the little you lives. And we live our whole lives trying to heal little us. So that whole thing built up in my head. And then you get there and you realize like, this is a real human being that has real struggles in life and may very well not be as evolved as you would like for him to be, but hasn't had the opportunities or conditions for that to happen. And It was a hard thing to do. I wanted to document it. I wanted to show it to other people. I wanted to show people the reality of what being a comedian was and being able to say, hey, listen, it's not all peaches and cream and it's a struggle for all of us. This is where my jokes come from. I'm showing you this. I'm giving it to you. I was going to confront it. And so that was me confronting my life. I appreciate the empathy with which you speak about your father's challenges and the circumstances that shaped him. And I think part of the tension of that moment is both being able to say this is a person who maybe did the best they could with what they had. And at the same time, it pulls you back into that dynamic of being the one who has to save everyone, who has to take care of everyone. That is the tension a lot of us find ourselves in where it's like, how can I both have empathy for this person I love, but not allow that empathy to cross over into undue self-sacrifice? Yeah. And that's a battle that a lot of us struggle with, especially now I have to be very careful with social media because social media is the playground of judgment. I saw this thread with this young woman who was going in on her parents and she was really like going in hard saying they were terrible parents and that you should hold your parents accountable. And I saw all that pain being expressed. And I started reading the comments and there were so many people that were younger that were like, that's right. You hold your parents accountable. You tell them this and you tell them that. I will tell you this. I don't ever want to be operate from that level of pain. Right. I don't want to be that angry with anybody that it will consume me to the point where it's, you know, what they say, you know, that revenge is drinking poison every day and expecting your enemy to die, whatever it is. But when I sat down and did my mother's timeline and I sat down and I did her story, then I did my own story. And I was like, my story was an evolved version of that because it wasn't quite as bad as her story was. But I was like, What my daughter is going to do one day, I hope, is be able to look at her story and look at mine and see that hers was better because of me. It's so easy to say all of that stuff. And then you become a parent and you think you're going to do it all the right way. And then one day your kids will be like, but you didn't. You have no clue. You got a blind spot because you're only human. And so for me, it was just like, is this going to be an indictment? Is it going to be a conviction of somebody? Or is this going to be part of your healing journey. And for me, that was the decision that I made. I don't want to hate my father. I want to understand why he is the way that he is so that I can employ empathy for him and give him some grace because obviously he didn't get it as a child. But it's taken a lot of work to be able to do that. There's a beautiful corollary in Legitimate Kid where you talk about your daughter and the name that she wanted to write. Yeah. Can you tell me that story? My daughter used to write my last name instead of her dad's last name. And she has her dad's last name. And, you know, her teacher just thought that it was, she was like, that's what Latinos do. Like the kids will come in there, right? Like she was like, they'll have like all these long names because some of the kids, you know, in Latin America, you have both of your parents' last names. And I was like, I don't know that anybody who was born in the 90s, in the 2000s is doing that. Sure, like some of these, you know, <laughs> some of the kids who have embraced the way the old customs are. But uh, anyway, she was signing her name and 
she was so proud to have my name. She was like, I don't want his name. I want your name. She was like, I want to be like you because you're the one that's here. And it was the complete opposite of me. And it made me feel like, damn, I wish I would have been like that with my mom because I was walking around just like, you did it wrong. Like you did it the wrong way. And my daughter, who I thought I did it the right way because I was married, was like, "Ah, that doesn't matter. What matters is the name that I'm proud of is this name. You're the one that's here. You're the one that's doing the work. And I just was like, I wish I could have had that. I wish I was fueled by that when I was little because it made me feel so, you know, it made me feel good. And I just left her alone because I kept, I was ashamed. I was like, stop telling people that you don't have your father's last name. I was married. You were born out of a marriage. You know, I was like, stop doing it. It feels like (laughs) the Game of Thrones. Like, (laughs) you like, you are your father's, you have your father's name, you know, Slayer of Dragons. I was like, you have the name. Like, what's wrong with you? And she was just like, that doesn't matter. Like, it doesn't matter to her. She was just like, I want your name. I'm proud of my mommy. With HelloFresh, you get farm fresh, pre-portioned ingredients and seasonal recipes delivered right to your door. Skip trips to the grocery store and count on HelloFresh to make home cooking easy, fun, and affordable. It is why it is America's number one meal kit. A very hectic schedule like I have, like you have, it can make it easy to fall into your dinnertime recipe route where you make the same three things over and over again. Keep mealtime exciting with over 40 recipes to choose from every week, so there's always something delicious to discover with HelloFresh. HelloFresh, they do all the shopping and all the meal planning for you. Ingredients arrive at your door pre-portioned and ready to cook, along with pictured step-by-step recipe cards. How easy is that? My favorite thing about HelloFresh is that it takes the guesswork out of making dinner. The recipe is there. The ingredients are there. All I have to do is follow the step-by-step guide. Go to HelloFresh.com slash 50Latina and use the code 50Latina, that's 50Latina, for 50% off plus free shipping. Go to HelloFresh.com slash 50Latina and use the code 50Latina for 50% off plus free shipping. One of the things I've always been drawn to about you, Isla, is your darkness. Like, that is the part (laughs) that I personally, as a fellow dark person, hook into. And so I, like, thought it was funny that at the beginning of Legitimate Kid, you say, like, I know you come to me for laughs, but that is not why you should be coming for this book. There will be some laughs in here, but, like, this is the truth. Yeah. Unvarnished and difficult and messy. And what I want to ask you about is... I am curious for you as someone who makes your living, at least part of your living as a comedian, how you decided to take the risk and tell a story that wasn't being told for the purpose of being funny. I am only a comedian on stage. And I think that that's been one of the things I've had to accept. And the people who follow me have to accept. I'm not the court jester. It is not my job to make you laugh at every turn. I am a comedian on stage. And if you want to see me tell jokes, you have to come watch me perform because that's where I am a comedian. Writing my book, I was an author and I wanted to sit down and respect it in that way. For me, sometimes it doesn't resonate when I read books that are written by people who are funny, who uh, trivialize their trauma because they have to feel like they got to stay consistent with what a comedian is. And they're like, oh, look, this happened to me. Ha, ha, ha. It makes me feel bad for the people who are telling their story that they can't fully just bask in the moment because they are relegated to this being funny. I wanted to tell my story without the pressure of a punchline. I also identify with that a lot because I think that is part of the reason that I, as a television host, personality journalist, don't give great meeting because people want that person who's out on set professionally lit to show up in a meeting. And I show up much more like a producer in energy where it's like, it is not, I'm not a a show pony. Yes. And the problem is people want a show pony very often when you get a lot more out of a workhorse. Absolutely. They will dehumanize you and, and they will reduce you to their entertainment. I'm an entertainer. And what I do is your entertainment, but I'm not your entertainment. And there's a difference. And especially people who are not of the ruling class, right? When you have a last name like Rodriguez, there are people who expect you to have, you know, people will say to me, like, I thought you would be a little more feisty, you know, like, or, or, you know, spicy, you know, like, and I'm like, spicy makes me feel weird. Like when I hear those words and those terms, but 
yeah, you have to fight for your agency and you got to fight for your humanity because at the end of the day, that is dehumanization. You would never walk up to George Carlin and be like, do the eyebrow, George. You know, no, you wouldn't. You'd be like, oh, they, they're like, oh, you, res- you resonate with me so much. I think you're you're brilliant. Thank you for saying it. So I refuse to be that. And that's been my journey and my plight in comedy. It's been a struggle for me. I don't have millions of followers. I don't get the big thing sometimes because I don't want to be that. For me, what I leave behind is going to be real instead of a caricature of myself that my grandchildren will be embarrassed of. And I want everyone to buy this book. I want everyone to read this book. What did I miss? I just thought about all the people who struggled with legitimacy, who are out there seeking validation. But the other part of this book that is very important to me is my mother. We kind of raised each other. I was part of such a painful journey and I was born into trauma because my mom was really struggling with the things that were happening to her. I always felt that my mother was worthy of understanding, not to excuse some of her bad decisions or to promote her not being able to do the best and sometimes, but I always wanted to give my mother grace and I really wanted to understand her. So this book was not just about me, but learning to understand my mother and doing research and learning things about my mother that I didn't know And I wanted to just share my journey with other people because a lot of times we grow angry and illness is born of a lot of anger, resentment, and pain. And walking around being mad at your parents for the rest of your life. But if we don't ever take charge of our own lives and from one point say, now I'm in charge, we will always be the victims. And I don't want to be a victim for the rest of my life. I wanted to be a victor. We can intellectualize this all we want. People's hearts are not healed. And if they are hurt, they are not going to give healing. And so I gave them grace and I got free and I feel so good because of it. It's a perfect note to end on, Isla, as always. Thank you so much. No, thank you. I appreciate you having me in always, you know, and I'm always here to show up for you. Thanks for listening. Latina to Latina is executive produced and owned by Juleka Lantigua and me, Alicia Menendez. Paulina Velasco is our producer. Cochin Tashiro is our lead producer. Trent Lightburn mixed this episode. We love hearing from you. Email us at hola at latinatolatina.com. Slide into our DMs on Instagram or tweet us at Latina to Latina. Check out our merchandise at latinatolatina.com slash shop. And remember to subscribe or follow us on Radio Public, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Good Pods, wherever you're listening right now. Every time you share the podcast, every time you leave a review, you help us to grow as a community. 